So before we jump into organometallic reagents, uh, I want to review a few things. Um, previously, we've seen how organometallic reagents like Grignard reagents, which are shown here, or alkyl lithium reagents, also shown here, or lithium dialkyl cuprates, um, which can are kind of have this R R two C U L I kind of structure are used in a variety of reactions. Now, because these metals have low electronegativity, the dipoles of the carbon metal bond point towards the carbon. Um, the carbon atom, therefore, is really electron rich and nucleophilic. Um, and that allows organometallic species to act like carbon nucleophiles or R minus to form really valuable new carbon carbon bonds. Now, we've seen where Grignard and alkyl lithium reagents can attack epoxide carbons to open rings, and we've seen how these reagents undergo nucleophilic addition to the carbonyl group of a ketone or aldehyde. And so the first one was from chapter 11, and then more recently from chapter 18. Now, the R minus from a lithium dialkyl cuprate favors conjugate addition to an alpha-beta-saturated, unsaturated ketone or aldehyde, which we saw in chapter 18. Grignard reagents and alkyl lithium reagents are very strong R- bases as well, which is why these alkyl lithium reagents are commonly used to deprotonate, deprotonate very weakly acidic carbon-hydrogen protons in the formation of a Wittig reagent, which we saw in chapter 18 as well. So, maybe the burning question in your heart is, how are these organometallic reagents made? Well, both a Grignard reagent and an alkyl lithium reagent can be generated directly from the corresponding alkyl halide, right? So, we can make these from an alkyl halide, alkenol halide, al Kynol halide or aryl halide, right? And so here we see in equation 2025, this is an aryl bromide. And um, specifically bromobenzene. And it can be converted into a Grignard reagent if it's treated with magnesium metal, like solid magnesium, in an ether solvent like tetrahydrofuran. And so that forms our Grignard reagent. We also see in the equation right below it, 2026, that we can have an alkyl lithium reagent uh, synthesized from an alkyl bromide um, by treating with solid lithium in ether. Notice that the aryl and alkyl halide undergoes reduction in both, in both of these reactions. The carbon's bond to an electronegative atom, bromine in this case, is lost and takes its place in and what takes its place is a metal atom. And that metal atom's electronegativity is lower than that of carbon. And so we learn that in this chapter that that's a characteristic of a reduction reaction. Now, alkyl bromides are not the only alkyl halides that can be used to synthesize Grignard or alkyl lithium reagents. These organometallic reagents can be synthesized from alkyl chlorides or alkyl iodides too and use similar procedures. Um, bromobenzene, which is shown here, is added to motor oils and fuels to act as a lead scavenging aid agent. Lead deposits form as a result of tetraethyl lead added to gasoline to improve engine performance. Tetraethyl lead was banned in the United States in 1996 for vehicles used on the roads but can still be used for aircraft and marine engines. Um, and so that's a common additive to gasoline. So let's talk a little bit more about lead diacyl cuprates um, because these are not generated directly from an alkyl halide, but rather they're produced from the corresponding alkyl lithium species using cuprous iodide, um, which is shown there in equation 2027. Now, the conversion of the alkyl lithium species into lithium dialkyl cuprate is a type of transmetallation. Um, and so the reason this is called a transmetallation is because one metal 
in the carbon metal bond is exchanged for another. And so that's a transmetallation reaction and how the lithium dioxyl cuprate is synthesized. Now, um, in previous chapters, we saw how these organometallic species are instrumental in really valuable reactions that form new carbon-carbon bonds. Now, in this chapter, we are going to introduce some new carbon-carbon bond forming reactions that rely on the organometallic species too, either as reagents or intermediates. Um, and the first few that we're going to talk about are coupling reactions and alkene metallicis. And so one of the things that we need to remember from chapter 11 is that reactions that form new carbon-carbon bonds are valuable in constructing the carbon skeleton of a synthetic target. And also, <clears throat> remember from chapter 18 that lithium dioxyl cuprates act as a relatively weak R- nucleophile in the conjugate addition of alpha-beta unsaturated aldehydes and ketones and other polar bonds. So, when we look at this equation here, 2028, lithium dialkyl cuprates also react with alkyl halides. So we have an alkyl halide here. Right? In this reaction, right, we have... Um, Sorry, if there was a pause there, um, <clears throat> I sneezed, so I apologize. Um, in this reaction, two alkyl groups are joined together, one from the alkyl halide and the other from the dialkyl cuprate. And so that's called a coupling reaction. So let's look at the, the two things that are coupled together, right? Um, this part here, those one, two, three, four, five carbons, are these five carbons here shown in black. And then I want you to look, shown in red right here, is that CH3 group, which is also shown in red right here. Um, notice it's just one CH3 group. So I want you to see how the copper lithium complex here has two CH3 groups. So whatever R group you have here, you're going to have two of them. That's, that's how they're synthesized. And one gets left behind with the copper. Lithium complexes with the halogen. And then one of those R groups forms the new carbon-carbon bond here. Okay? So um, that's something to kind of be aware of. Other things to be aware of, and this can happen, these can happen with a, or involve a wide variety of alkyl halides and organocuprics. Um, when we look at this, this is kind of the shortened version, right? Where you see the two R groups and the R. The R from the alkyl halide can be methyl, primary, or secondary, a vanillic or aryl group. Okay, so vanillic, remember, is one that's attached to a carbon carbon double bond, aryl is the benzene ring. But notice it can't be a tertiary, okay? Then the R prime from the di dialkyl cuprate can be an alkyl, vanillic, or aryl group, right? So any of those alkyl groups. And then the halogen is either going to be a chlorine, bromine, or iodine, um, which complex nicely with the one-on-one. The -on -one. I want us to look at some examples of this. So let's look here. Um, what we see here... And this first one is going to be an aryl um, halide. And so we can see how that reacts with the um, cuprate lithium group there. Then we can see in equation 2030, the vanillic halide. So there's that double bond. And um, I want us to, to look at something really carefully here. I want you to notice that this retains its configuration. And so because it retains its configuration as trans, right, because when it's shown like a zigzag like that, it's trans, the cis looks like more of a U-shape, um, this, we classify this then as stereospecific. 
because it doesn't it doesn't change configurations there so it will retain that configuration now um, the organo cupric coupling reactions that we've looked at are not the only type of coupling reactions that are used in organic synthesis there are lots of others that have been developed using a range of metal atoms and so we're going to look at two other coupling reactions here both of which involve palladium um, the two we're going to look at are the Suzuki reaction and the Heck reaction. These reactions um, were found to have such widespread use in organic synthesis that Akira Suzuki, uh, who developed the Suzuki reaction, and Richard Heck, that developed the Heck reaction, uh, shared the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2010 along with uh, Ichi Nagishi, which I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that, um, So let me spell it here. Um, and so I remember when this happened and everybody was really excited because it was a reaction that we had learned in organic chemistry, um, just as you are learning it in organic chemistry. And, um, and, and these, these three gentlemen won, and so it was really, really neat. Now, um, there are a lot of variations of the Suzuki reaction, but in general, uh, a vanillic or aryl halide is treated with an organoboron complex. So we don't we haven't seen a lot of boron complexes to date. So this is kind of our first boron complex that's coming in here. I want to remind you that boron has is one of those exceptions to have it the octet rule where it's pretty happy not having a full octet here. Um, so we're we're completely happy with the six uh, electron the six electron groups or electron shared electrons there. Um, now, we also use a palladium catalyst. Um, this palladium catalyst has the kind of formula here, PDLN, um, where when we look at this, um, that L stands for a ligand or a ligand. I've heard it pronounced both ways, which is just a group that's attached to a metal. Okay, um, similar to like an R group, uh, ligands or ligands are referred to in inorganic chemistry as just a group that's attached to a metal. In this case, what we see here are P, PH3, right? Um, and so that's, the, that's that carbon group that's attached. Um, now, I want you to notice the Suzuki reaction is shown here. And what we see in this through this reaction is that where the alkyl halide is, right, the alkyl halide, the, the halide part is replaced with one of the groups from the boron here. Okay. Um, and so it's this, it's particularly this group shown in red. And if there's a double bond, there's a retention of the configuration. So this is considered to be, uh, again, stereospecific. Because we're going to retain that stereochemistry. Um, let's talk about the borons here for just a second. I want you to notice that the group that attaches to the iodine is the one that's not an oxygen bond, okay? So notice here, this group stays with the boron with the two oxygen bonds. The group that's directly, the carbon that's directly attached to the boron is the one that is now attached here, okay? So that's how when you're looking at a boron complex, you know which one is going to be attached. Now, I want us to look at an abbreviated mechanism for the Suzuki reaction. Um, before we get started, there's a couple ways the Suzuki reaction um, has been represented. Um, sometimes it's shown linearly and sometimes it's shown as a circle. Um, I'm going to show it linearly because that kind of sticks with everything that we've seen. If you are more like circular in your thought, thought processes, then I can come to my office and I'll show you it laid out in a circular fashion. So what we're going to do first is we are going to start with 
the alkyl halide, the XR, okay? And we are going to add our palladium ligand, LN, okay? So some sort of palladium um, with a number of groups. And it's going to go through oxidative addition. And that's the first reaction it's going to go to. Now, when this happens, the ligand there with LN and the palladium stays there. And then the halide is attached to one side of the palladium and the R group is attached to the other. Okay. And there are no arrows for that. Now, this happens in a basic environment. So the hydroxide here is going to come and attack the palladium and the halide here is going to leave. And that is a substitution reaction. Okay, and so once we've got that substitution reaction, the boron is gonna come through and we are gonna go through a transmetallation. reaction. Now, before we do, right, um, the boron, when it gets put in, there's it's basic. There's plenty of OHs running around. And so the boron that we order, right, and add is something like this, right? It's got two oxygen bonds that are bonded to our groups. In the previous slide, they kind of bonded up and made a ring. That's totally fine. And then this R prime, okay? The R prime there is what's really important. That's what's going to um, change. And just to kind of differentiate that, I'm going to put uh, two primes there, okay? Because those are going to hang out. Now, when we put this in the flask, in this really basic environment, what happens is the OH minus also reacts with the boron. And so those electrons come in and attack the boron. And so now we have this complex where we have a boron and now it's carrying a negative charge because, right, it's now got eight electron groups. And there we are. Okay, so all we've done is add the boron and the boron's kept that negative charge, right? Now, the boron substance is gonna react with a palladium. And so what happens here are the electrons that make up this bond in a transmetallation, we start the arrow in the middle and we bring it down here to the palladium and then it bumps off this OH. Now, when it does that, this part stays the same and now that R prime group is attached, right? And then we have the original R that we started with. This goes through something called a reductive elimination. And in this reductive elimination, right, these electrons come over here and attack that R group. And then these electrons go back up on the palladium. Now, what that means then is we have formed a new complex with the R prime from the boron and then the R from the alkyl halide. Then we've regenerated our palladium catalyst, which is great because palladium is real expensive. So it's really nice that we have regenerated it there and that palladium can work on another cycle. So we don't need a lot um, with this particular mechanism. Now, similar to the Suzuki reaction, the Heck reaction can couple one vanillic or aryl group to another. Okay, so remember, vanillic groups are double bonds. So we, what we have here is a vanillic um, halide, right, where we've got that double bond there. And so when we look at this particular reaction, um, basically the R from the Rx, so this would be the Rx, right, and it's the R part where the X is the halogen, um, replaces the hydrogen shown there in red 
on the HR prime. Okay, so whatever molecule this is, it stays the same and we just shove on, right, a new carbon-carbon double bond. Okay, so a new carbon-carbon double bond is formed, not single bond is formed. Okay, now notice that both of these retain their configuration. So again, this is stereospecific. Okay. And again, similar to what we've seen before, the X can be chlorine, bromine, or iodine. So let's look at this reaction. So just like before, and again, this sometimes can be shown as a circular reaction. If that's something you're interested in, comes, I have some of that in my, I have an example of that in my office, but I'm going to show it linearly. So again, we are going to use a palladium L2, right, with two ligands, and it's going to go through oxidative addition. Okay, now, just like the Suzuki reaction before, right, we end up with an X and an R bonded to that palladium. Now, this is a new reaction style that we're going to see. It's called an insertion. Okay. And so what happens here is we have the double bond, and I am going to use the abbreviation sub, um, right, for substituent. So it's something with a double bond, right, and then there's some big substituent off of it, okay? So whatever the rest of the molecule is, as long as it's got a terminal double bond there. So what happens here are these electrons from the double bond come down and attack that palladium. And when they do, these electrons up here attack that carbon, okay? And so what you have then is this kind of L2 palladium. The X remains unchanged, okay? And now we end up with your hydrogen, the R group there, right? Because this used to be the double bond and the substituent, okay? So that big group off of it. So, because remember, we got some hydrogens happening here, okay? But now we've got an R that's attached to this carbon and there'll be another hydrogen running around, okay? So, but I have drawn that hydrogen because it reacts. So know that there's another right? Hydrogen there. Okay. But we're going to draw that re that because it reacts. Um, and this R is really more poking out like this, Boop, like that. So let's put that on a solid wedge. Okay. So here's what happens. These electrons come up and they attack that palladium. These electrons fall down here and attack and form a double bond here. And this is called a beta hydride elimination and now you've got an R and a substituent there around a double bond okay now this is kind of uh, the product that we think about right but what does happen is you still have this L2 palladium with those electrons there. And so this will go through a reductive elimination um, where, and regenerate the catalyst. And so it'll come in here and those electrons on the nitrogen will, uh, will pull back that hydrogen. Those electrons will go on the palladium. Those electrons will go on the oxygen. So that's a reductive elimination. And we have regenerated our catalyst back. So again, palladium is expensive. The ability to regenerate the catalyst is incredibly helpful for us. All right. So ways, these are ways to build new carbon-carbon bonds. Um, 
And the next thing we're going to look at is something called a Grubbs catalyst. And this is an example of metathesis. So, um, and specifically, we're going to look at alkene metathesis. So when we look at this, if you've got deforine and it's treated with a Grubbs catalyst, a mixture of deck Forine, the starting material, oct -forine, and dodec sixine are produced. So this, as I mentioned, this is an example of an alkene metathesis. An older terminology for it was an olefin metathesis. So sometimes you'll hear it referred to as an olefin metathesis. And what happens here are portions of the molecules joined by the carbon-carbon bond in the products um, were not initially joined in the reactants. Now, um, this is an example of, as we mentioned, the alkene and olkene uh, olefin metathesis. Um, these generally take place under equilibrium conditions, and so the yield tends to be really low because the product alkenes have thermodynamic stability similar to that of the reactant alkenes. So just kind of something to keep in mind here. Um, this, by the way, is the Grubbs catalyst. So it's a ruthenium catalyst that looks like this, but you can also see it as a Grubbs catalyst. So I want you to recognize it as both ways. Now, so we're right here at equilibrium, right? And the yield wasn't super great, but all enterprising chemists know about Le Chatelier's principle. And so Le Chatelier's principle can be exploited by removing the products as they form. So, for the reaction, like the one shown here, where the product is a mixture of liquids, um, that can be kind of cumbersome and challenging to remove this as the products are formed. However, if the reactants are terminal alkenes, then one of the products is ethane, and that's a gas that it can escape. And so um, that as that escapes, that concentration decreases, and it continues to shift the reaction um, towards the products. Um, and so basically it makes that reaction irreversible. Okay. Um, so this is the alkene metathesis and it's basically irreversible uh, when ethane's produced. And so we can see here using the Grubbs catalyst where both of these are terminal. And when both of these are terminal, they produce the ethane here. Um, the other thing it can be used for, and is most often used for, is a ring closing reaction, okay? Where these two shown in blue go off to form ethene. Ethene's a gas that escapes, and we've closed the ring here. So, let's look at this mechanism, okay? So, we're going to start with two... Um, Molecules. So we're going to have the original alkene. Which is shown here. And then this is the Grubbs catalyst. Okay, and so that's, and that's a metal. So the M there, um, that, that M is really the ruthenium chlorine L2 portion. And we're just going to shorten it to M. Okay, so the first thing that happens here is an addition. And in this addition, what happens is these electrons come up and they attack that metal and then these electrons come down here, okay? And we form a four-membered ring. So, got an M here, C, H, P, H. Right, and um, this is, it's a four-membered ring, so it's pretty strained. So it's gonna go through a ring opening. So in that ring opening, these electrons are gonna come here. And these electrons are gonna go there, 
right? Right? And so now you've got this complex and Okay, so what happens next is that um, we are going to undergo a, a second addition, okay? So another unit of the original alkene comes in. So we're going to go through another addition. And at this stage, we've got all sorts of molecules floating around in our flask. We have another alkene that comes into play, okay? And what happens in this addition is the exact same thing that happens in the first addition. These electrons go here and attack this. Nope, nope, I'm backwards. Sorry. <clears throat> no, no, I was right. These electrons go here and attack this. And then these electrons go here and attack that. Okay. So, so not exactly, nothing's attacking the ruthenium catalyst there, but we're having those two double bonds are attacking the, the carbons. Okay, so now, again, we form the metal there is attached to the CH2, okay. which now CHR here, CHR here, and here, okay? And so now we're gonna go through another ring opening. Where these electrons are gonna go here and those electrons are gonna go there. And that's our new alkene. And then we end up with the metal and the CH2. Okay. Um, I want to highlight the original alkene for you so it makes it a little easier to see it. Okay, so this was our original alkene. Okay. This was our original alkene. So it, it stayed the same. This was our original alkene. Okay. And then... This right here is a second molecule of our original alkene, okay? Um, and so, when we look at this over here, that comes from the blue, right? And that comes from the yellow. And the other yellow CH2 is right there, okay? So, or the other yellow carbon ended up there. So hopefully that will help you kind of track where things are going. Um, I just am trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to say about that, but I think that's it. All right. So this is the um, end of chapter 20. We've talked about oxidation reduction reactions in this chapter, and we've also settled down and talked a lot about organometallic reactions as well. Um, organometallic reactions are a whole field into themselves. I took a whole class on it in graduate school. So this is really just a taste. If you're more interested in it, uh, feel free to stop by my office and we can talk more about it.